Charlie Luciano didn't care about the Mafia, at least not the one with its outdated rules and traditions based in Sicily. The old-timers believed Sicilians, and only Sicilians, could be trusted. According to Lucky, their rules were obsolete and a hindrance to his plan, a plan that would bring regional gangs together to form a board of directors, which became known as the National Crime Syndicate. Lucky believed he could work with and trust Jews, blacks, Italians from the mainland, and yes, even a few Irish. But the current Mafia leadership, known as Mustache Pete's, had a different view. Joe the Boss Mazzaria tolerated the Jews Luciano did business with, but he didn't like them. And Salvatore Maranzano was even more of a purist than Mazzaria when it came to the Mafia. He didn't trust Lucky's Jewish friends in the least, but by September 10, 1931, it mattered little. Both Mazzaria and Maranzano ceased to be of concern to the idealistic Charles Lucky Luciano. He saw to that. With Mazzaria and Maranzano out of the way, Luciano achieved his goal forming the syndicate. And contrary to popular opinion, a few Jews sat on the board of directors, including the man who became known as the Al Capone of New Jersey, Abner Longy Zwillman. Carl Syphakis writes, with the exception of Meyer Lansky, Abner Longy Zwillman was the most feared and respected member of the Jewish Mafia, the tough, bright Jewish gangster who played a key role in forming the National Crime Syndicate. Born July 27, 1904 of Russian immigrant parents, Zwillman hailed from Newark, New Jersey. One writer notes, Zwillman reportedly dropped out of grammar school in the eighth grade. His departure from school roughly coincided with the disappearance of his father. Other reports added that Zwillman's father passed away sometime in 1918, and as a result, Zwillman quit school to help his family. Whichever account is true, Zwillman got his first job working in a cafe owned by a local alderman. It was good work, but the money just wasn't enough to help support his family. He then tried his hand selling fruit off a push cart, but again he came up short. So he subsidized his income by adding lottery tickets to his inventory, and it didn't take long for Zwillman to realize there was more money to be made in the numbers racket than peddling fruit. By 1920, Longy, a nickname given to him by his friends because he grew to be six foot two, controlled the bulk of the numbers racket in the upper class neighborhood of Clinton Hill. The racket was so lucrative that within a short period, he hired some muscle to help protect his interest. Despite his reputation as a mobster, Longy never forgot his Jewish heritage. As a youngster, Zwillman earned the gratitude of local Jewish peddlers because he and his gang, the Happy Ramblers, defended them from assault by Irish thugs. Whenever the Irish came into the Jewish district to create trouble, a cry went up in Yiddish to call the tall one, and quick as a flash, Zwillman and his pals would stop whatever they were doing and rush to help. When prohibition became the law of the land, Zwillman had the foresight to see dollar signs. He first partnered with Waxy Gordon, running illegal hooch in and around New Jersey. But he had bigger plans, and eventually broke off on his own. Unlike most prohibition operators, Zwillman reinvested his profits back into his business. He poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into political protection, buying off beat cops, police captains, judges, anyone who could help protect his growing rackets. Within a short period, Zwillman controlled much of the illegal alcohol which poured into the Garden State. As the good times rolled, Longy expanded his gambling operations, invested in whorehouses, took over numerous unions, and purchased nightclubs and restaurants. As his wealth grew, so did his reputation and influence. J. Robert Nash explains, Abner Zwillman, who had risen steadily through the ranks of the underworld, helped arrange the 1929 sit-down in Cleveland. Zwillman even dated the leggy actress Jean Harlow and helped her land starring roles in two films with Columbia Pictures by giving its president, Harry Cohn, a huge loan. And though he was known as a stone-cold killer, 
Longy often cloaked his illegal activities by playing the part of a knight in shining armor. When the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped in 1932, the gangster posted a sizable reward. Years later, Zwillman donated $250,000 to finance a Newark slum clearing project. Zwillman also understood the necessity of good friends. He partnered with other gangsters across the country, men like Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Willie Moretti, Louis Lepke Bacalter, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Jacob Gura Shapiro, Frank Costello, and Joe Adonis. One report states that just before Prohibition ended, Zwillman was responsible and controlled 40% of all the liquor which entered the United States. One of his partners and best friends was Willie Moretti. Moretti, an early boss of a tough New Jersey crime family, was his junior partner and provided murder muscle when Zwillman needed it. When Dutch Schultz swore to kill New York District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey, the board of directors of the syndicate, including Zwillman, voted that Schultz had to go. Schultz was gunned down on October 24, 1935. Carl Syphakis continues, Zwillman was one of the key figures in the new combination's successful efforts to absorb the Dutchman's empire. In the process, Zwillman became the undisputed boss of crime in New Jersey. Zwillman was such a powerhouse in the state that candidates seeking political office from both parties would solicit donations and favors. In 1949, Zwillman offered Democrat gubernatorial candidate Elmer Wien a $300,000 contribution if he would allow Zwillman to name the state's attorney general. Needless to say, Wien refused and lost the election. But by 1950, Zwillman's star began to dim. His taxes had become an issue during the Kefauver hearings, and as a result, government pressure increased. Three times the feds tried to get Longy on tax evasion. He was indicted in 1956, and the government was sure that they had him this time. But surprisingly, the jury never reached a verdict. Thomas Hunt explains that years later, an FBI microphone installed at Newark Supreme Beverage Company overheard men conversing about steps that were taken to ensure that Zwillman would not be convicted in that trial. 1957 turned out to be a bad year for Longy. Everything began to change. Vito Genovese was making moves to take over the Luciano family, but he feared the retaliation of Luciano ally Albert Anastasia. Some reports indicate that when Genovese floated the idea of taking Anastasia out, Zwillman objected and sealed his fate with the ambitious Genovese. Others stated there was concern that Zwillman might spill the beans about the syndicate and its workings during his upcoming testimony before the newly formed Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management. On February 27, 1959, shortly before his scheduled appearance before the McClellan Committee, Zwillman was reported to have committed suicide in his 20-room mansion in West Orange, New Jersey. Police investigators found bruises on his wrist, an indication that he had been bound and gagged. To this day, most believe Zwillman was murdered. Years later, Meyer Lansky blamed Genovese for the death of his old friend, but many speculated that Genovese wouldn't have moved against Wilman without Lansky's permission. Before he died, Charles Luciano took Lansky to task for not standing up to Genovese and for betraying their old friend Zwillman. Close associates of Lansky noted that when the subject of Zwillman was brought up even years later, he often spoke and had the look of regret in his eyes.